welcome here to Barn Blog, and we continue our long journey through the Leon thesis. Um, if you're new here, there's a lot of back to this. We're in the middle of the text, but we've also gone through Bordega's biography. We've gone through the political context uh, with him and Gramsci and Tugliati. We have gone through uh, um, some other things about Bordega. So far, I haven't seen a whole lot that's unique to Bordigism here in the Leon Theses, which is interesting since it's such an essential text. Um, both invariance and the invariant program and uh, organicism have so far not really been mentioned in the text, and Bordega has mainly backed up his position in classical Comintern doctrines. He is critiquing Stalin in the USSR, but he's doing so on grounds of classical Comintern doctrines and with Lenin. Now, if you're familiar with the work of Eric Von Rie, everybody does that with Lenin. Lenin moves his positions and changes his mind. And a lot of times people who are fighting over the real meaning of Lenin all have real quotes and real policies of Lenin to back themselves up. Uh, you can, you know, anarchists often take this to mean that Lenin was a duplicitous you know, inconsistent opportunist. Other people see it as a brilliant maneuvering as reality shapes itself. I'm somewhere in the middle, but I'm not saying that Bordega is necessarily the real reader of Lenin here. Trotsky, Stalin, Kamenev, Kamenev Gramsci, Tagliati. I can just list names. All thought that they were pulling as much from Lenin as they are from the Second International or from Marx and Engels. Uh, probably more so. So I'm not saying that that makes what Bordega is saying valid or invalid, but I am saying that it, so far there's not a whole lot that we associate with Bordegism in its full-blown mature manifestation when Bordega reemerges from obscurity in the 50s in this text. But maybe it's coming up. And we are in the section called the International Disputes, and we're now in the fifth point of that, which is disciplines and fractions all right so to the text itself discipline and fractions another aspect for the call for Bolshevization is the complete centralization of discipline and the strict prohibition of fractionism are considered the secure the guarantee of the party's effectiveness it's a weird translation Another aspect of the call for Bolshevization is the complete centralization of discipline and a strict prohibition of fractionism are considered the secure guarantee of the party's effectiveness. Yeah, I read it right. The final court of appeal for all controversial questions is the central international organ, which within which at least political, if not hierarchical hegemony is attributed to the Russian Communist Party. Actually, this guarantee is non-existent. The whole approach to the problem is inadequate. In fact, Rather than preventing the spread of factionism within the international, it has been encouraged to assume mask and hypocritical forms instead. From a historical point of view, the overcoming of the fractions in the Russian party wasn't an expedient nor a magical recipe applied on stationary grounds, but was both the result and expression of faithful delineation of the problems of doctrine and political action. I don't know about that, man. There were fractions within the, the Bolsheviks until 1921 when they were banned during the Civil War. Faction bans were not, you know, even though you see something like faction bans all the way back to the first international, kind of. Um, proper faction bans in the Bolshevik party were not codified until the Civil War. So this is an interesting reading of the Russian situation, Bordega. Disciplinary sanctions are are one of the elements that ensure against degeneration, but only on the condition that their application remains within the limits of exceptional cases and doesn't become a, the norm and virtually the ideal of the party's functioning. I, however, think this is a dead, uh, a, a dead good point. And I use dead good almost ironically here because um, what it amounts to execution of party members in other countries and their extrajudicial means through the common turn would become a major part of the 1936 through 1940s common turn practice uh the leader of the japanese communist party was executed by the common turn. several leaders of the chinese communist party were executed by common turn um uh, 
even a few Americans dis were disappeared. This is not a great idea. When that becomes the primary business of your party is to police your own in this way, this is usually a disaster. All right, so Bordega has got a point here. So while I don't think it's true that they just organically got rid of factions in the Bolshevik party before 1921, just because they all learned to get along with Lenin, I also see this point as pretty, pretty dead on. The solution doesn't reside in a useless increase in hierarchical authoritarianism whose initial investor is lacking both because of its incompleteness of the historical experience in Russia, impressive though they are, and because even within the old guard, the custodians of the Bolshevik traditions, disagreements have been resolved in ways which it cannot be considered as a priori the best ones. But neither does the solution lie in a systematic application of the principles of formal democracy, which for Marxism have no other function than as organizational practices which can be occasionally convenient. The communist parties must achieve an organic centralism. Here it is. This is this is something unique to Bordigism. Organic centralism as opposed to democratic centralism. Because Bordiga sees democracy as a, as a manifestation of bourgeois rule. Just like he sees fascism. And in fact, he sees them as basically the same thing. All right. So here we got an organic centralism. While including the maximum possible consultation with the base ensures the spontaneous elimination of any groupings which aim to differentiate them to the self. This cannot be achieved, as Lenin put it, this cannot, this cannot be achieved with, as Lenin put it, the formal mechanical prescriptions of hierarchy, but through correct revolutionary politics. This is something that I've never understood about what they mean by organic centralism. So people are just going to cohere together based off of what? Expertise? bureaucratic expertise, the mind of the party, etc. Now, I have a whole essay that I wrote, you can find on Libcom if you can figure out that they spelled my name wrong, um, where I go through and talk about the, the way this gets developed in Bordiga that makes it seem like Technocracy Inc. and a way to get around antagonism without faction bans or formal repression. And I don't see how that's possible. I think this is a very strange, almost idealist reading of history. But this is the first thing here where we see a real departure from Lenin. Democratic centralism, as going back to Schweitzer from the LaSalle faction of, of, the, of the Second International, was a principle of the Bolsheviks. It was a principle of the Second International as well. Didn't come from Marx and Engels, but you can kind of read it there because there is a focus on centralization in Engels. I think Bordega may be implying that the addition of democratic was actually the problem. I'm not so sure. It makes a hay out of a lot of the other Marxian arguments. But nonetheless... So, the repression of factionism isn't a fundamental aspect of the evolution of the party, though preventing it is. But how do you prevent it, Bordega? Let's continue. Maybe he'll give us the answer. To claim that the party and the international are mysteriously insured against the relapse, or a tendency to relapse into opportunism, is not only fruitless and absurd, but also extremely dangerous. Because such a relapse could indeed occur due to the changing circumstances, are to playing out of the residual social democratic traditions. We have to admit that every differentiation of opinion not reducible to the cases of conscience, our personal defeatism, must develop a useful function in the resolution of our problem and to protect the party, and the proletariat in general, from grave diggers. If such dangers become accentuated, then differentiation will be inevitable. But useful taking on the fractionist form and might lead to schisms. Oh, it's going to lead to schisms. That's one thing communist parties do is like Protestant denominations. They schism. However, this won't happen because of childish reasons, because the leaders haven't put in enough energy into repressing everybody. But given the terrible hypothesis of the failure of the party, it's becoming subservient to cabin revolutionary influences. We have an example of the wrong method and the artificial solutions applied to the plight of the German party after the opportunist crisis in 1923. And when, whilst these artifices eliminate factionism, they at the same time hindered spontaneous determination within the ranks of the highly advanced German proletariat of the correct classes and revolutionary response to the generation of the party. 
the dangers of bourgeois influences acting on the party doesn't appear historically as the organization of fractions, but where there's a shrewd penetration stoking up a unitary demagoguery and operating as a dictatorship from above and immo immobilizing initiatives by the proletarian vanguard. The defeatist factor cannot be identified and eliminated by posing the question of discipline in order to prevent factionist initiatives, but rather by successfully managing to orientate the party and the proletariat against such peril at the moment when it manifests not just as doctrinal revision, but as an express proposal for important political maneuver with anti-classist consequences. This translation's weird. <laughs> um, I'm going to blame that on the translation because I'm not sure how they're using classes here. It might be something clearer in Italian. One negative effect of the so-called Bolshevization has been the replacement of conscious and thoroughgoing political elaboration inside the party, corresponding to a significant process towards, an M towards compact centralism with superficial and noisy agitation for me mechanical formalism of unity for unity's sake and discipline for discipline's sake. This... Method causes damage to both the party and the proletariat and that it holds back the realization of a true communist party once applied to several sections of the international becomes a serious indication of latent opportunism. At the moment, there doesn't appear to be any international left opposition within the common turn, but if the unfavorable factors were we have mentioned worsen, the formation of such an opposition will be at the same time be both revolutionary and necessary and a spontaneous reflex to the situation. And I, I, I guess actually this is what Bordega thought Trotskyism was going to end up being and the left opposition in general, which involved, I don't know, about half of the old Bolsheviks um, who were purged later. Question six, tactical questions up to the fifth Congress. Mistaken decisions have been made in a way that the tactical problems posed by the previously mentioned international situation were settled. Like analogous mistakes made in the organizational sphere, they derive from the claim that everything can be deduced from problems previously faced by the Russian Communist Party. And Bordega is saying here that, like, hey, the, we all love the Russian Party. We think the Bolsheviks, you know, gave us a model for revolution, but um, it, it was for Russia. The, the, the conditions of Russia are not the conditions of the developed world. Why are you trying to enforce them on us? The United Front tactic shouldn't be interpreted as a political coalition with other so-called workers' parties. So this is uh, the rejection of the United Front from above, that you don't form allegiance with workers' parties. Now, just to break it down so people who don't know, the Popular Front is you will form allegiances with workers' parties and progressive bourgeois parties and progressive elements of the bourgeoisie. The United Front and you can sit with them in a joint government as a as a as a player in the government. Um, the united front is you can work with workers parties and join with them on tactical issues, but you can't sit with them in a joint government um, that and the united front from below is you can only do that with workers organizations that are not political, such as trade unions, business unions, et cetera, uh, informal workers affiliations, but you shouldn't do it with parties that are subsumed to the bourgeois state. Now, Trotskyism tends to, tends to endorse the united front from above and below. That was also the stance of the second and the early third international. The popular front doesn't develop until the 1930s. Uh, first in France and in Italy, actually, uh, and then it moves up. Um, during the the what was called third periodism, that is 1937 to about 1932-33, uh, the Soviet Union actually adopted the United Front from a from below only strategy. Uh, no working with workers' parties or even socialist parties, um, and this was particularly the model in Germany, we kind of know how that went. Um, Bordega is basically endorsing the position that the common turn would actually endorse after he leaves the communist party um, or does not get reinstated and is booted out. I'm, it's a little unclear to me how that goes exactly. 
Um, but nonetheless, there you go. The basis for the united front must therefore be sought in proletarian organizations which workers join because of their social positions and independently of their political faith or affiliation to an organized party. So labor, we can work with formal labor unions. The reason is twofold. Firstly, communists aren't prevented from criticizing other parties or gradually re recruiting other mem new members who used to be dependent on those other parties into the ranks of the Communist Party. And secondly, it ensures the masses will understand the party when it eventually calls on them to mobilize behind its program and under its exclusive leadership. Experience has shown us countless times that the only way of ensuring revolutionary application of the United Front lies in rejecting political coalitions, whether permanent or temporary, along with committees, which include representatives of different political parties as means of, of directing struggle. Also, there should be no negotiation proposals for common action or open letters to other parties from the Communist Party. So we don't play with other people. Now, I'm going to say that I'm pretty sympathetic to uh, United Front from below first. I am. I want to be clear that United Front from 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 above is it is not really a question in North America since we don't have coalitionary parties. So we couldn't be a part of a coalition government and United Front from above. And the popular front, I think, has largely been a disaster, um, although maybe in certain situations I could see supporting it, but I'm pretty hesitant. Um, in the American situation, since we don't have a multi-party coalition, it just means subsumption to one or the other major party, um, which is the United Front has been interpreted in America basically to mean that we can endorse issues but not candidates, um, etc. But even when that's been done, that often leads to tacit just tailing the Democrat or Republican Party. Uh, I don't have a good answer here for the United States because part of the problem is constitutional but it is something to look at. However, um, and this is different from a lot of council communists who didn't even think you should work with trade or uh, trade unions or business unions or anything like that because they were all too built into capitalist bureaucracy. Um, I don't know what to make of that. I, I tend to be sympathetic to a lot of council communist arguments, but that one's always baffled me because I have no idea how they're going to, how they're going to, um, you know, get workers to join in in former coalitions if they can't join workers' organizations. All right. Anyway, practical experience has proved how fruitless these methods are, fruitless these methods are, and even any initial effect has been discredited by the abuses which they have been put. The political uni united front based on the central demand of the seizure of the state becomes the workers' government tactic. Here, we have not only an erroneous tactic, but also a blatant contradiction of the principles of communism. Once the party issues a call for the assumption of power by the proletariat through the representative organism of the bourgeois state apparatus, or even merely refrains from explicitly condemning it such, a, such an eventuality, then it becomes abandoned and rejected the communist program not only vis-a-vis -vis proletarian ideology, but with it all the inevitable damaging consequences because the party itself would be establishing and accrediting the ideological formulation. The revision to this tactic made at the Fifth Congress after the defeat of Germany has proved, hasn't proved satisfactory, and the latest developments in the realm of the tactical experimentation, experimentation justify for the abandonment of even the expression workers' government. As for the central problem of the state is concerned, the party should issue a call for the dictatorship of the proletariat and that alone. There should be no other workers' government. The workers' government leads to opportunism and opportunism alone, i.e. support for or participation in the self-styled pro-worker governments of the bourgeois class. So what he's saying here is even the United Front still tacitly supports the bourgeois government even if they don't sit in it. There's some, there's some, uh, some letters from Marx that would back this up. Um, however, this gets taken by Dementist D-A-M-E-N and by cancel communists to basically mean uh, you shouldn't even work with unions uh, and there should be no united front at all. <laughs> um, none of this contradicts the slogan all power to the Soviets and the Soviet type organi organism representative bodies elected by workers 
even when the opportunist parties predominate in them. The opportunist parties oppose the assumption of power by the proletarian organizations, since this is precisely the proletarian dictatorship, exclusion of non-workers from the elective organs of power, which the Communist Party alone will be able to accomplish. I mean, I don't know the accomplished problem. Maybe I'm was actually able to accomplish that it wasn't uh wasn't really true anywhere but it tried to uh suffice to say that the formula of dictatorship of the proletariat has one synonym and one synonym alone the government of the communist party now that's another place where bordigism distance differs with council communism um since the since the communist party will be eventually the the exclusive organ and brain of the proletariat the government would be on the communist party but um it would still here at least function with something like democratic mechanisms in the soviets to get leadership from the working class but only workers in those unions and stuff that compose those soviets could join them this still very much feels like ba it's based off early ussr uh questions we'll do one more section and we'll stop Seven, the question of new tactics. The United Front and the workers' government used to justify on the following grounds that having just uh, that just having communist parties wasn't enough to achieve victory, since it was necessary to conquer the masses, and in order to conquer the masses, the influence of the social democrats had to be fought on the terrain of those demands, which are understood by all workers. Today, a second step has been taken, and a perilous question has is posed. To ensure our victory, they say, we must first ensure that the bourgeoisie is governing in a tolerant and compliant way, or that classes intermediate between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat should govern, allowing us to make preparations. The latter position, by admitting the possibility of a government originating from the middle classes, sinks to a total revision of Marxist doctrine as equivalent to the counter-revolutionary platform of reformism. The first position aims to to refer solely to the objective unity of conditions insofar as they allow propaganda agitation organization to be better carried out. But as we have already pointed out with regard to particular situations, both are equally dangerous. Everything leads us to predict that liberalism and bourgeois democracy, whether in its antithesis or in synthesis with the fascist method, will evolve in such a way to as to exclude the Communist Party from juridical guarantees for what little title they're worth since it places itself outside of them by negating such guarantees in its program. Such an evolution in no way contradicts the principles of bourgeois democracy, and in any case, it has a real predecence uh, in the work of the so-called left-wing governments. And, for example, the program of the Italian Avantain Parliament. Any freedom given to the proletariat just means substantively greater freedom for the counter-revolutionary agents to agitate and organize within its wank. The only freedom for the proletariat lies in its dictatorship. But again, Bordega means dictatorship of the proletariat as manifested by the Communist Party and not just of someone ruling in their name. Although exactly his mechanism, I will say, is not clear here. And it's not clear in a lot of the works I've read by him, but we're going to read more over, over the course of the year as I continue working on stuff on Bordega. Anyway, back to the text. We've already mentioned that even a left-wing government created the conditions that we found useful that they could be exploited if the party had consistently held to a clearly autonomous position. It isn't a matter of attributing diabolical cleverness to the bourgeoisie, but of holding on to the certainty. Without which, how is it possible to call oneself a communist, that during the final struggle, the conquest of the proletariat will come up against a united front of the bourgeois forces, be they personified by Hindenburg, MacDonald, Mussolini, or Nazca? To habituate the proletariat to picking out voluntary and involuntary supporters from within the bourgeois front would be to introduce a factor of defeat, even if any intrinsic witness of any part of this front will clearly be a factor of victory. In Germany, after the election of Hindenburg, an electoral alliance with social democracy and the other Republican parties, a bourgeois party, such as the Parliamentary Alliance and the Prussian Landtag, was proclaimed in order to avoid right-wing government. In France, support was given to the Carte de Gaulle's. In the last municipal elections, the Clincy tactic. For reasons given above, such tactical methods must be declared unacceptable. Even the thesis of the Second Communist of the, of the Second Congress of the Communist International on the revolutionary parliamentarianism imposed on the Communist Party the duty of only operating on the electoral terrain on the basis of a rigorously independent position. Yeah. So what what Bordega is afraid of is that United Frontism is already beginning to develop to what we're going to later call popular frontism. 
The examples of recent tactics indicated above show a clear, though not complete, historical affinity with the traditional methods of the Second International. Electoral blocks and collaboration with them, which were also justified by laying claim to a Marxist interpretation. Such methods represent a real danger to the principles and organization of the international. Incidentally, no international congress have passed resolutions which authorize them and which include the tactical thesis present at the Fifth Congress. We're going to stop here. Now, we finally get to something in this that's unique to Bordega. And I have problems with it, but it's coming out of a real frustration and critique that he has with the party overly focusing on discipline and the way this has been used to opportunistically subsume communist mo methods and motives into other kinds of governments in ways that hamper their independence. And that this may work in backwards countries that still need to achieve a bourgeois revolution. And that's, that's the way border is going to think of it, at least in, in the 1920s. Um, but that this is going to be a disaster in the developed world. Was he wrong? Well, I don't know that his answer to the question is right, but his diagnosis should really hit people today, given how many times popular fronts fail and subsume themselves to larger movements. And that's where I'm going to end it today. Keep your peace. Like and subscribe. Hit the bell. We have a Patreon. Blah, blah, blah. Have a great day. You can find the podcast uh, for free if you want to hear the interviews. And if you want audio versions of this and you don't want to look at my stupid face, uh, you can do that by subscribing to the Patreon.